as you know, this is a forum for um, country governments, civil society, and critically implementing partners and, and other experts in key population responses. Um, and today we're looking at measuring and monitoring key population uh, program outputs and outcome at national and global level. And this is the second session of this um, webinar. There was the um, same session held um, a few hours ago for different time zones. So we're glad that you, you could make it and, and, and join this session. Um, we have um, an exciting uh, agenda ahead of us, but let me just say a few words ahead of, of of why we're here and why this is why this is critical at this stage. We have um, a global aid strategy that sets out the uh, ambitious targets, both on the treatment side and on the prevention side, with fewer than uh, 370,000 new HIV infections in 2025, down from um, what is still now more than 1.4 uh, 1 million new, new, new HIV infections according to our latest published estimates, so a dramatic reduction needed. And why we have not achieved these targets in the past, the single largest reason was actually we haven't achieved um, those reductions among key populations. And what the new global aid strategy sets out is an agenda with differentiated and detailed targets um, for all populations, including key populations, with specific sub-targets for treatment, uh, for key populations, applying the 95, 95, 95 for all populations, including key populations specifically, and then a whole set of granular prevention targets with key populations. And in order to do that well and achieve those targets well and really apply that granular um, approach to HIV prevention, which is needed to achieve our overall impact goal, we need data, we need monitoring of key population responses to understand um, where we can focus to understand how we can improve the uh, improve programs to understand where we are in the in in the response. So data and monitoring and evaluation really plays a critical role in achieving our impact impact level goal. Um, do we go maybe to the next next slide? So colleagues, you see here just. Um, a few critical um, um, parameters for this this webinar. Um, you see that you can choose at the bottom of your screen your preferred language, um, and we have the different languages here for for translation. Please use the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen to ask questions to the panelists and um, upload other attendees questions or comments. Next slide. So um, when you look at this, this slide, you actually have here the agenda for this afternoon afternoon noon session um, um, with, with different contributions, starting with a global overview, then going into really practical approaches from country level, country government experience, civil so society um, experience, and um, then finally, uh, fi finally and, and, and both in... Uh, accompanied by some, some Mentimeter, Mentimeter interactive um, elements of this, of this webinar as well. The objectives are really just three, understanding why monitoring evaluation of key population programs is critical, uh, learn how countries are actually doing it on the ground, implementing and, and, and monitoring and evaluation systems for key populations and reinforce the need for community feedback and leadership in monitoring um, key population programs. Um, with that, um, I'll I'll just um, hand over to the first group of speakers, um, providing the global overview. Um, and these are Keith Sabin from from UNAIDS, Amrita Rao from Johns Hopkins University, and and Kate Rajinsky. So, without further ado, over to you, Keith, um, Amrita, and Kate. Start with the presentation. Thank you, Clemens. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I hope to expound a little bit on why ending AIDS as a public health threat by 2030 cannot happen unless we prioritize key populations. 
Next slide, please. So th there are two concepts about the way we can approach target setting for achieving this, this lofty goal of ending AIDS as a, as a public health threat. One would be the public health approach in which we set the targets by, by asking, can we achieve the overall target while leaving out some groups? And this is a very utilitarian approach, looking at efficiency as an important element. And then there is a rights-based approach in which the targets are applied to all possible groups. And this is an equity approach. And we are, uh, UNAIDS and, and the larger global AIDS uh, response community is working on a, with, with the idea that we're using a rights approach and an equity approach to how we uh, achieve our goals. Next slide, please. So I, I think most people have seen some iteration of this graphic where the number of new infections has been steadily declining since the mid 90s, but we're really not on a trajectory that will take us to the target set for 2025 and certainly not the target for 2030. So unless there is a, a major change that leads to a downward inflection of this trend, we're going to miss these targets. Next slide, please. In the case of AIDS-related deaths, we're a little bit closer to the target, but if we extrapolate that line outward, we will still miss that target. And while new infections are a function of successful treatment and prevention, the prevention of AIDS-related deaths is, is almost entirely based on ART coverage and achieving ART coverage at high rates so that people are dying from other natural causes other than AIDS. Next slide, please. So again, a, a figure that most of you have probably seen, when we've done some analyses to look at the distribution of acquisition of HIV infection by different among different communities by different modes of transmission, we can see that globally, much of the, the transmission events are taking place among key population communities and their, their sex partners, including clients of sex workers. Next slide, please. And it, it's important to note that the Sustainable Development Goals indicator for HIV includes very explicitly a disaggregation by key populations. And so we are working at UNAIDS and with various partners and stakeholders to improve what we can say in a disaggregated fashion specifically about key populations and the various risks and needs that, that they face. Next slide, please. When we consider that disaggregation here, where we're looking at the global distribution of, let's say, modes of transmission on the left, the, the distribution in sub-Saharan Africa in the center, and then all of the countries that are not in sub-Saharan Africa on the right, we can see that we're experiencing quite different epidemics, which again, I don't think is news to people on this call, but it, it does point to the fact that in the vast majority of the world, prevention resources should be focused on key population communities and those people close to them if we're going to have an impact in those countries. And even more importantly, just because the numbers of infections in sub-Saharan Africa are so large, nearly half of all new infections may be occurring among key population communities and their partners. If we do not address 
those communities, we will be certainly falling short of our global goals. Next slide, please. As we all know, the relative risk of acquisition for each of the, the, these key population communities is very high. And keep in mind that a typical relative risk from, say, smoking cigarettes for lung cancer would be on the order of two. And so here we're looking at relative risks from 14 to 35. So much higher. Uh, you may leave it on this slide. What we're seeing, next slide, please. What we're seeing is really a stagnation. Now, this slide's a little bit older, but it, it still holds as far as I'm aware for, uh, until 20, through 2021. We're seeing stagnation in our progress in HIV incidence among the different key populations specifically for female sex workers, people who inject drugs, and transgender people. And what we're very clearly seeing is a worsening of the epidemic among gay men and other men who have sex with men. Next slide, please. Part of the challenges, that, one of the challenges that we face is that many in the key population communities remain uncounted by the relevant authorities in their countries. In other words, the governments aren't counting the numbers of people in each of these communities. And what we see here are for those countries that are doing some level of counting, we believe they're underestimating by those numbers that appear in orange on this figure. And the numbers who are not counted at all because the countries do not have any data appear in that greenish yellow uh, uh, top segment of each bar. So the numbers are, are quite substantial. And if we're not counting people, then we, we're not including them in our responses in those countries. Next slide, please. So what the global strategy has done is, is divide up the way targets are set and the way we may approach the, the development of those targets, uh, the activities toward, to address those targets by the relative uh, risk that is faced by each population. So when it says sex workers are at very high risk of acquiring HIV, greater than 3% refers to HIV incidence in this case. So the idea being that if we wanted to be slightly, somewhat more efficient, we would begin by focusing on those segments of each of these communities who are living within that very high column. And then the, the work would cascade down to those people who are in the high column, and then finally to those who are in the moderate and low column. Next slide, please. Now, this doesn't apply to every category, but it, it does apply specifically to PrEP, where we have different, uh, different targets set for numerical targets set for PrEP use based on risk category. Um, for condom use, though, for example, we're, we're looking at very high coverage for condoms in the 95% range and 90% for lubricant with less client or non-regular partner. So you, you can get a sense that these, this is just a sample of the targets, and if people are interested, the targets are published on the UNAIDS website. Next slide, please. Just to give an idea of the numbers we're talking about, I, I just grabbed a screenshot of uh, some countries that begin with the letter G and H and looked at the numbers of people who are thought to exist within the highest, the high risk group. And so in Ghana, we're talking about roughly 72,000 people who would be in the high risk group and therefore would benefit from the use of PrEP. So we're, we're talking about pretty significant numbers here, it, it just for the, the rollout of PrEP. And as the slide title says, we have these kinds of numbers for about 160 countries. 
Next slide, please. Um, just to translate that into to numbers to give you a sense of how big they are, we're estimating that there are almost 12 million female sex workers globally and that the coverage target is about 9% of the female sex workers for those who are at the highest risk. And that would be 1 million women just for sex workers. And you can see the other numbers here. So we're looking at, just to cover the highest risk individuals, roughly 8 million people on PrEP. Next slide, please. Just to give an idea, we're nowhere close uh, that we are nowhere close to prep. We we do see pretty extraordinary rollout in East and Southern Africa in the last two or three years, but we're, we're nowhere near the eight million target uh, that 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 analysis the previous slide suggests. Next slide, please. And here is here is the shortfall by region. You can see the red dots signify the PrEP target for 2025. And aside from East and Southern Africa, and I guess you could argue uh, Middle East and North Africa, we're, we're really not getting close enough. And next slide, please. And then finally, just to give a sense of some of the other uh, coverage uh, uh, with different prevention targets, these figures appear in our global report for the last few years. Uh, just to read them real quickly, if the black bars of the triangle in the center of each circle reach the margins of the colored triangle or pyramid, then we're reaching the target. So the one group that seems to be reaching the target is in the lower left-hand corner where sterile injecting equipment you, uh, is available at last injection, it, it appears to have reached its target, um, at least in the three countries that reported in East and Southern Africa. So we see that we're really falling short among with prevention coverage among key populations, in, at least in East and Southern Africa. And I can assure you that the other regions look fairly similar to this, this figure. And now I'll turn it over to Amrita for the next section. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Keith. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I think we can advance to the next slide. Um, thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present today. Um, my name is Amritha Rao, and I'm faculty at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. On behalf of myself, my colleague, Dr. Kate Ruchinsky, and the team at Johns Hopkins, I will be presenting on the utility of repurposing program data and opportunities to answer program relevant questions for key populations. So in today's presentation, I will briefly walk through what routinely collected data are, how they might be repurposed, and challenges and opportunities to using these data. I will then spend you know, the majority of the presentation sharing a series of three case studies that represent some of our recent work in applying these concepts. Next slide, please. And next slide again. So as a refresher for most, routinely collected data are data collected for purposes other than research or without specific research questions developed prior to collection. These data are collected to support clinical management of patients or for monitoring and evaluation of program activities. Often when people think of routinely collected data, they think of you know, clinical information from health records but routinely collected data can also include health administrative data, program registers, surveillance data. Next slide, please. So the process of data collection and capture varies depending on the specific program, the clinical encounter, and a number of other factors. So this slide is just showing an example of the data collection and capture for a PrEP clinical encounter. So we show the slide to highlight that because the primary purpose of this data collection is for clinical management, that is the primary priority, and there are potentially multiple opportunities for this process to go awry. Next slide, please. So the duration or quality of clinical encounters may vary with changing case burden or changing staff with different levels of training. Next slide, please. 
the clinical environment may be fast paced and certain fields in a data collection tool may seem redundant or not useful for clinical management and therefore may get left blank. Next slide. Physical folders may be removed for use, um, which may challenge linking of forms for the same individual over time. And then next slide. And there's always the possibility of data entry and linkage error during data capture. Next slide, please. So we share this example of different process issues to highlight that there are challenges with program data, but there are also you know, many opportunities. These data are from a real world setting. They are already being collected and therefore don't require additional investment of resources or person power. These data can help in studying much larger groups of people and they can help us answer questions that could otherwise be unethical or too expensive to study. Next slide, please. So the development of questions of impact using routinely collected data often involves a partnership. Um, questions developed can and should be responsive to program needs and gaps in knowledge, including demand for services, available resources, implementation, and identification of hotspots. Continuous feedback and adaptation of approach to those implementing the program is critical. Next slide, please. So utilizing program data in this way, we're not only able to shed light on program relevant questions, but also have the ability to examine and strengthen program systems along the way. Next slide. So switching gears, uh, we now wanna share the three case studies. Next slide, please. So in the first example, we examined patterns of PrEP initiation, discontinuation, reinitiation, and cycling among female sex workers and adolescent girls and young women who initiated PrEP in South Africa. Next slide, please. So this and the next case study example are made possible by a longstanding research practice partnership between TBHIV Care and JHU. TBHIV Care is a South African NGO that serves as the largest PrEP provider to young women in South Africa. They operate at multiple sites across six provinces. And to date, the program has initiated more than 40,000 young women at high risk on PrEP. Available program data were reviewed together and questions were developed to be responsive to program needs and gaps in knowledge. Next slide. Our analyses here included FSW and AGYW receiving prevention services through TBHIV care. The data were inclusive of multiple sites across six provinces from 2016 to 2021 for FSW and from 2018 to 2020 for AGYW. Next slide. We plotted the monthly proportion of eligible HIV negative encounters who initiated PrEP over calendar time. We estimated time to PrEP discontinuation and plotted Kaplan-Meier survival curves. We estimated time to reinitiation and then used an approach called group-based trajectory modeling to look at cycling. Next slide, please. So here are just some of the different figures we were able to put together. Next slide, please. And just for the sake of time, though I'll be happy to share any of these results separately, um, we found that the number and proportion of initiations increased each year for both FSW and HUIW. One month PrEP persistence was about 40% for both populations. By seven months, less than 10% remained on PrEP. And the majority of FSW and HUIW experienced what we called limited use of PrEP. So they started and then they, they never came back. Um, but some form of cycling, so on and off use was not uncommon. And again, if you're interested in reading more about this particular study, we can share the link to the paper that was recently published in AIDS. Next slide, please. So next for our second study, uh, we wanted to evaluate the impact of implementation strategies on PrEP persistence among this population served by TBHIV care to really help the program to understand what was working and what was not working. Next slide. So the primary outcome of this analysis was PrEP persistence at one month. Data at the individual level were aggregated to produce monthly site-specific counts of the number of women who picked up their one month PrEP refills and counts of the number of women who initiated PrEP in the prior month. Next slide. TBHIV care introduced several implementation strategies to try to promote PrEP persistence during this time. They included strategies that targeted community level, clinic level and individual level barriers. Next slide. 
We then utilized an interrupted time series approach to assess the impact of strategies on one month persistence, fitting a Poisson regression for the number of completed one month prep refills. We evaluated the independent impact of clinical mentoring for providers, SF SMS refill reminders and support techs, the case management approach, um, and the loyalty rewards program among FSW. And the FSW specific statistical model we used is represented in this, uh, this equation. Next slide, please. So this figure shows the monthly trends in one month prep persistence by site for FSW visualized against the introduction of several implementation strategies. Each strategy is represented by a dashed line, purple for loyalty rewards, blue for SMS, red for clinical mentoring and green for case management. And not all of the strategies were implemented at all of the sites. Next slide, please. Data from the nine different FSW sites were included for a total of 11,020 total initiations. Clinical mentoring for providers and SMS support texts and refill reminders were associated with relative increases in prep persistence um, and the analysis suggested no effect of the case management approach and the loyalty rewards program was asso negatively associated with persistence. And the paper that presents this work is currently under review. Next slide, please. So for this last case study, and I'm sorry to be zooming through these so quickly, but would be happy to discuss any of this later. Um, I present this on behalf of Dr. Kate Ruchinsky and Talia Loeb, who have been leading this work on extrapolation of population size estimates for FSW and MSM in Namibia. Um, this work was led in collaboration with the Datafy Consortium in partnership with USAID. Next slide. So the lack of reliable PSEs for key populations, as we all know, contributes to gaps in knowledge across the HIV cascade. Size estimates are often volatile and unreliable, and they are frequently not available in settings with the most unmet needs. Small area estimation and extrapolation approaches can help fill these gaps using other auxiliary data sources, but often program data are not considered when conducting uh, small area estimation exercises. Next slide. So this slide shows a table of the available direct PSEs for Namibia for FSW and MSM across different regions that were shared with us in support of this work. The goal here is not to focus too much on the numbers themselves, but rather to note that for each region and population, there's quite a bit of variation in these estimates based on the method or approach used. Next slide. In addition to these estimates, we are also working with census data, population projections, and other auxiliary data sources to fill these gaps. And we are also provided with quarterly program data from implementing partners in Namibia, comprising the total number of FSW and MSM that were routinely seeking services. These program data may serve to ground truth PSEs for key populations. So while this approach is imperfect, these data can basically function as a lower bound for population size estimates in districts or regions where services are being provided. Through this work, we were also hoping to really systematize the way in which program data can be used to inform extrapolated size estimates for KP. Next slide, please. So here we show a tool called the Triangulator, which is an R Shiny app developed by Dr. Ian Fellows and colleagues. This tool leverages known information about the distribution of each population to inform a singular estimate for each region. So it essentially just weights each direct estimate based on user-defined confidence. And this approach necessitates some prior information about the distribution of the population size to be included to help triangulate estimates. Next slide. And this table depicts three different tests of the triangulator tool using different confidence levels that were informed by prior information and our team's knowledge of these methods. So in these internal tests, the various methods were ranked by level of confidence, zero to 100, and triangulated estimates were generated and compared. So in this example, we use direct estimates from Zambezi that ranged from 80 to 5,500, but generally produced um, triangulated estimates around 400. So our resulting estimates were gener generally robust to different confidence levels, with the exception of you know, really extreme confidence levels like zero or 100. And you know, importantly, where program data fits into it, this is that the prior beliefs that were input into the triangulator for the distribution of the derived size estimates were based on that quarterly program data. Next slide, please. I'll skip this, data, uh, this slide for time. Maybe we could go to the next one. 
Great. So um, as a final product, you know, the final extrapolated national estimates that use the program data um, and the triangulator tool for FSW range from almost 5,000 to over 13,000, comprising one and a half to 3.6% of women ages 15 to 49. Next slide, please. And for MSM, the final estimates range from 4,600 to 10,000. Next slide. So using SAE approaches, the team combined epidemiologic and program data to generate subnational size estimates for key populations in Namibia. And future work is really needed to determine how best to include program data in KP size estimation studies, ultimately bridging research with practice. Next slide, please. And then you can go to the final slide. So in summary, we hope that in this presentation, this really rapid fire presentation, uh, we've begun to make the case that program data present opportunities for new collaboration, for repurposing existing data, and importantly, for shedding light on program relevant questions. And then the final slide, please. So just to say thank you again for the opportunity to present today. Feel free to reach out to myself or Dr. Kate Ruchinsky with any questions. Our emails are here. Um, we also wanted to thank our team members at the Key Pops program in the Center for Public Health and Human Rights, including Dr. Seth Baral, Kylie Willis, and Marianne Roach, um, and also wanted to thank our many partners who have supported this work for many years. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Amrita and Keith, for this great global overview um, that Keith provided, and um, also the very inspiring examples that Amrita shared and of course all of this data is is available in in terms of the global trends on the UNAIDS webpage maybe just pointing you to two specific tools the key population atlas where a lot of um, information specific to key populations is summarized on the UNAIDS webpage and also the global HIV prevention coalition webpage with uh, the prevention coalition scorecards which synthesize a lot of the program coverage and outcome data and put it in perspective relative to the global targets that Keith has showed um, in his presentation. So with this, I, I believe we go to a Mentimeter um, uh, re reflection. Yes, so can we move? to the next slide, please. So Carabo has provided the Menti link in the, in the chat, so please click on that. Um, and then um, respond, please, to these questions. So why would you prioritize monitoring and evaluating key population programs in your country? We see answers coming in here, so one answer. So please click on the Mentimeter link, enter your answers, um, and when we start seeing answers, we will um, display them here. Um, so we see an, a number of um, relevant reasons here, evidence-based programming, um, the HIS2 tracker to monitor and use identifying gaps in implementation planning and prioritization. Um, to appreciate the effect of the prevention to understand the prevention effects. Um, um, yeah, focus on key populations because they're most effective, uh, affected. Um, planning for health services. So a number of relevant reasons. Um, Resource um, settings, so really resource needs estimation is another way how we use this um, this data, and, and you'll find the latest resource needs estimate um, in the global prevention um, roadmap represented and in more detail also on our web page.
thank you really for all those those relevant um, considerations um, for prioritizing monitoring and evaluating key population programs. Um, maybe we can move move on. Um, of course, capture also any further answers that are coming in. Um, Yes, so thanks. So with that, um, we'll move to the next um, section of this webinar, which is about practical approaches to implementing a monitoring and evaluation system to monitor progress of key population programs. And we have here two country examples, um, one from Dr. David Boyd from Kenya, describing the Kenya ME system for key population responses, and then Dr. Ketiwan Skvilia, um, Ekaterinwatse, and Maka Gorgia from um, Georgia to, to speak to the Georgian experience. So over to you, Dr. Boyd. Thank you very much, and good afternoon to everyone. I, have, I hope I am audible and also visible to the audience. Thank you. We can hear you and, 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 and see you and see your slides. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can begin. So I begin by presenting to you the key population program in Kenya at a glance. So the program is led by, is within the Ministry of Health, that is at the National AIDS and STI Control Program and the National Syndemic Diseases Control Council since uh, 2008, and it's able to provide strategic leadership, technical support, coordination, and evidence by, you know, the standards that are set, resource mobilization, establishing an enabling environment for programming for our key population. We also have a technical support unit, which was introduced in October, and this unit was established to support the scale up of interventions, uh, since uh, 2012. We do have funding for this program through the Ministry of Health, uh, PEPFA, the Global Fund, and two other funders to our 95 sub-recipients within 37 of our 47 uh, counties or the sub-national uh, administrative areas. So the MOG leadership role is to instill confidence within our implementing partners who are the sub-recipients to implement a prevention program for the key population despite the fact that uh, sex work, sex, same-sex relationship, uh, drug possession, uh, and use are, also, are still criminalized uh, in Kenya. Next slide. So the role of the key populations in Kenya in terms of uh, driving the HIV epidemic. Um, so we have evidence through studies, uh, and the initial one was in 2008 through the Kenya Modes of Constitution Study which identified that the key population groups disproportionately were disproportionately affected by HIV and were contributing to 33% of all new infections. But uh, recent data shows that is as 2020, this has gone down to up to 13%. Now, when it comes to the biobehavioral study that gives us the HIV prevalence uh, across the typologies, uh, the first BBS that we did in 2010 showed a high burden of HIV amongst this population, and they had prevalence of three to five times higher than the general population. However, <clears throat> we were also able to do uh, population size estimates in 2012, but I'll show you the most recent one in 2020 showing an increment across the typologies from female sex workers, about, around 200,000 of them, men having sex with men, around 61,000, People who inject drugs, around 26,000, and transgender, which is a new program that began in 2020 uh, with about around 4,300 of them. So basically, that just shows um, the contribution of uh, the key populations in terms of their size and the burden of HIV in terms of the prevalence for HIV. Next. So what are the data sources for the key population program within Kenya? We do get data and information from the mapping that we conduct in size estimation. We get from the routine program uh, monitoring data that we also collect monthly. 
outcome surveys that are conducted from time to time, research and special studies that have been able to be conducted. And all these different sources are utilized in decision making for the program. Next. So as part of this project, we have had actually uh, the activities, exercises of mapping and size estimation from the population. And uh, this actually began in 2012. And we have a second one conducted uh, 2018 to 2020. This is also inclusive of uh, virtual mapping, which was conducted uh, in 2019. This is specifically for the MSM population who meet their partners in uh, virtual spaces. And we have been able to use this data to determine our denominators. Once we have these denominators, we're able to set targets, develop a scale-up plan, and actually advise our implementing partners on how we're actually going to reach uh, these populations um, and measure our success in the areas of uh, the various counties where they do implement uh, these services. And then, of course, this is evidence-based, and we use this to develop our guidelines and reach the enriched, especially uh, the group that I mentioned, the virtual uh, MSMs and the Yankee populations who are even more hidden compared to the, gen the other two populations. Next. So a bit of presentation of uh, um, the routine program monitoring. So I'll begin by mentioning uh, the journey that we had by, first of all, developing national tools. So from 2014, we were able to have data collection tools for the country. And then in 2018, uh, revised the same. And uh, first of all, is uh, we began by mapping the genetic partners uh, within the country in 2012 develop the reporting tool in 2014 as per the diagram. And this is a partnership. We had members of the key population communities. We had donor agencies, implementing partners. And uh, the tools were then revised in 2018. And the output is, you know, we have a robust uh, collection of these uh, data collection tools, about 22 of them. Some tools are reported monthly, others quarterly. And we have been able to appreciate uh, improved reporting from the time we began up to current. Next. So concerning the same uh, tools that were developed, the next step of course was to do conduct a capacity strengthening or capacity building. And this series of trainings uh, involved definition of indicators and variables, the responsibility of the various staff, cadres, and tool completion and also trained on the periodicity of filling the tools. Also, most importantly, was uh, the quality of the reporting was uh, checked from time to time. We had just review of the receipt of the reports, regular DQA being conducted, analysis of the data, sharing out uh, back to the implementing partners where the data came from, to the county or subnational level and back to the national level. And then we have quarterly presentation of this data to the technical working groups and the committee of experts. Next, please. A key highlight that we wish to present um, is uh, from the unique identifier code guidance from our NASCOP uh, online resources is uh, the fact that we have unique identifier codes um, that we use to strengthen routine monitoring. And this is actually able to just make sure you're able to know each and every one of the key populations without really outing them by using the identifiers, their names, but being able to ensure that we're able to capture not only ge geographical components, but the implementing partner, the hotspot where they come from, the psychology, um, the a and demographic factors. So we're able to utilize this uh, very key component even as we're doing uh, routine monitoring, routine monitoring. Next. Uh, we do have one national reporting system, even as much as we're collecting data all the way from each of the implementing partners, the drop-in centers, all the way through the sub-national to the national. We do report through the Kenya Health Information System and the register we do have is called an H71 plus and we have a, a illustration of how it looks like. This data is aggregate. And then for those who have electronic uh, um, uh, 
uh, availability, be able to use the Kenya EMR to, to report. And this is actually how the platform uh, does this light. And this is actually able to build the real time for at least updates monthly for each of the sites that are able to use the EMR uh, platform. Next. Uh, concerning this, I think I've mentioned, I've mentioned before that all the implementing partners are able to uh, provide information or data to the MH741 flag on a monthly basis. And the form is filled and submitted through an officer from the health records department, enters this data to the KHIS. It is, the data is analyzed by the county on the national level. And this is utilized to monitor program progress and performance. And uh, as I mentioned, for those who have electronic platforms, they're able to utilize the EMR systems, domiciles within Kenya EMR to relay the same information next. Um, so this is just a, a presentation of hotspot uh, analysis and information uh, use. So we have the hotspot levels, the IP level, sub-national and national level by sub-population, where we're able to just present data uh, that has been reported from the lower levels all the way and aggregated to the higher levels. And we do this uh, analysis uh, quarterly. Next. Um, this actually just shows, all this is just an illustration of the types of data that we receive. So we have very, very key information from the lowest level, that is from the hotspot, from the key education or community level, all the way up towards the national aggregate uh, data. And this is just a replication of what um, we're able to present in terms of data. Next. So this is a national reporting and feedback uh, framework or the loop system we do have, just showing the entire process, how data is collected and how it's channeled to the various levels up to decision making. So we have the implementing partners collecting data and reporting using the standard tools that we have developed and devised. And we have county and national levels receiving this data, going through county checks or MND checks for data quality, for is being sent out to clarification, data analysis and forwarding uh, up to the, the county technical working groups, we have the donor and national levels. And uh, then this information is utilized by the imp implementing partners to address the program gaps that we have based on the data analysis that has been presented. So uh, in view of the time that I have, just wanted to demonstrate how we do uh, measurement of outcome. And the, the pictorial that you have there is a HIV prevention program cascade for the female sex workers at national level. And you can see on the right hand side in orange or brown, behavioral outcomes. Just two of them that I want to talk about. We have condom use at last uh, sexual encounter and uh, consistent condom use. We're actually able to measure outcomes uh, during this uh, process of looking at all the data that we do receive. Next. Coordination and management, we do have an MND subcommittee that is actually chaired by NASCO, but we have several uh, members within this committee and they all report within the national uh, key population technical working group. Next. Okay, so that was my time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Boyd. Great overview on the Kenya national system for um, key population program monitoring, which really provides yeah, great insights. And I think is one of the critical ingredients to the high performance and the high coverage um, that the Kenya um, program has has achieved and which is also a program we have to 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 acknowledge which which has this very strong partnership between implementers governments but also very strong community led um component um with that over to the 
team from Georgia were already introduced before. So without further ado, over, over to you, colleagues, um, on the piloting of the BBS light among super inject drugs in Georgia. Thank you very much, Clemens. I'm really happy to be part of today's workshop and be able to present our experience with piloting new BSS light methodology in people who inject drugs in Georgia. And I'm presenting on behalf of my colleagues also, Ekaterina Ruadze and Marka Gogia. Next slide, please. After hearing lots of great examples of using routine data and also uh, standard BSS that we consider as a golden standard of monitoring epidemic in key populations, I think uh, for today's audience, it will be interesting to hear about this, this new simplified BSS methodology. But first of all, let me start with the introduction. Uh, to country context. Georgia is a small country, 3.7 million. Uh, estimated number of people who inject drugs is slightly more than 52,000. So this is around 2% of the population, which is quite a uh, large percentage. We are on the crossroad of drug traffic from Afghanistan to Europe. So drug inflow is increasing in the country. And to serve this uh, key population, we are implementing needle and syringe program. At present, we have 14 dropping centers countrywide, nine mobile ambulatories, and geographic coverage is up to 45 cities and more than 100 reduction workers. First BSS in this key population we conducted in 2007, and after that, we tried to repeat um, standard BSS in every two, three years, but as you know, uh, external funding of four HR programs is decreasing in our region. State has uh, limited resources. It covers only critical diagnostic and treatment services. So we were really looking for more simple quality but affordable BSS methodologies. Next slide, please. And therefore, we learned uh, and accepted with great enthusiasm new offer from UNAIDS and WHO to test. BSS lights. So main object of uh, objective of our study was to see if this methodology can still measure HIV and we also measured HCV prevalence, uh, assess risk behavior and also uh, access and utilization of prevention, testing and treatment services. And if a uh, study uh, can generate evidence for advocacy, policy making or program. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see a uh, methodology of BSS slide, and we can uh, speak about um, comparison between light and standard BSS. Uh, we decided to uh, use same sample sizes uh, for both studies. Uh, uh, BSS slide we conducted at the beginning of 2022 and standard BSS uh, also last year. And the sample size was 2000 in light and 2005 for standard BSS. Um, recruitment time was six weeks for uh, light and 12 weeks for standard BSS. Uh, BSS light was implemented by needle and syringe program service providers, standard BSS by human service providers. Uh, questionnaire was about five times shorter for uh, BSS light. And we used a mixed recruitment methodology. About half of participants we recruited uh, through Snowball, uh, and another half uh, were recruited at the service centers or through uh, mobile outreach. In standard BSS, as you know, we are using respondent driven subtype. And also, uh, interviewers for BSS slide were um, NSP star. While for standard BSS, we uh, hired external interviewers. Time of interview was less than 20 minutes for BSS slide and more than 45 for standard BSS. And finally, but very important is cost. BSS slide budget was uh, 2.6 times smaller than standard BSS. We spent um, about 75,000 US dollars on BSS slide. Next slide, please. Uh, study cycles, uh, they are, of course, uh, similar for both studies, but I would like to share some of the observations for BSS light. Um, 
uh, field experts uh, were asking us if community-based organizations or MSP service providers uh, have capacity to implement um, DSS methodology, DSS studies. So in our case, they had, because they had experience of implementing peer-driven intervention, which also utilizes respondent-driven sampling, and it was easy to train them on DSS right steps. Also, the fact that a uh, study was implemented by community-based organizations, uh, refusal rate was uh, uh, smaller, less than 5%, and the uh, uh, study uh, process was pretty similar to the standard service provision uh, by MSP sites. Uh, at some days, we observed a huge surge of participants, uh, but it was okay because uh, staff stayed after working hours but they are uh, receiving incentives so uh, they did not complain about this but the fact that study was implemented again at uh, community-based organizations who are also implementing state um, HIV prevention program for testing they were able to use state procured rapid diagnostic tests so it was cost saving for a BSS light and they were able to uh, report all new clients they identified during study to the state program. So it helped them to reach testing targets and also uh, get additional income for organization. Also the uh, fact that they already had trained staff at organization who could do rapid diagnostic tests and collect the blood samples if a test was positive. Um, uh, so it, they did not have to hire anybody from outside. Next slide, please. On this slide, you can see screenshots of uh, study tool itself. We had electronic questionnaire and also dashboard, especially dashboard where it was very uh, important because it allowed us to track uh, new clients, which was very important because we wanted to make sure that at least half of the participants that we were recruiting were new for the MSP. Next slide, please. So at the end, 47% uh, uh, of all participants were recruited through Snowball, uh, about 24% through mobile outreach, and 29% at service centers. 33% of all participants were new for the MSB program, and majority of them, 64%, were recruited through Snowball. Next slide. Uh, uh, we also compared the results of DSS light and uh, standard DSS. Of course, it's you cannot directly compare these two studies. It's like comparing apple with pear. But it was interesting for us to see uh, what would be actual results for these studies if they are very different or we can still talk about some similarities. And I can say that for uh, many indicators, uh, we observed more similarities than differences, but uh, I would like to highlight a few of uh, results. For example, DSS light was able to recruit more female uh, participants, 2.6% versus 1.4% in case of standard DSS. Uh, in addition, for the main indicators that we report to Global Path, for, for example, or uh, that is also part of Global AIDS monitoring reporting, that is uh, use of clean needle sensor during last injection or use of condom during last sex. Both studies uh, um, reported uh, provided uh, very comparable results. For example, for clean needle use, DSS light result was 81.5%, standard DSS 78.7%. For condom use, uh, DSS light was 79% uh, and uh, standard DSS 38.7%. Uh, next slide. Uh, but HIV prevalence was 1.4% uh, uh, in case of DSS light. 0.9% in case of standard DSS. We still would like to see if this difference is statistically significant. Uh, largest difference we observed in uh, testing for HIV during the last year 
for BSS light is worth slightly more than 69% and standard BSS 37.9%. Uh, but when we looked uh, for um, a new clients, uh, results for uh, BS in BSS light, then it was quite comparable to standard BSS 36.3%. We observed difference uh, also in um, hepatitis C RNA uh, prevalence. For antibody prevalence, we had very comparable results, but RNA prevalence was higher in standard BSS 24%. Um, in BSS light, was it was 14.7%, uh, but it was expected because uh, at MSP site, we have integrated hepatitis C point of care testing and treatment. So it was expected that uh, RNA prevalence would be lower in, um, in people who inject drugs interviewed uh, through BSS light. Next slide, please. Uh, about the lessons that we learned uh, through implementation of this pilot, we can say that this uh, uh, methodology is really simple. It saves time, it saves cost, it provides uh, different opportunities for recruitment. It also sh a shorten study implementation time. Uh, questionnaires are shorter and uh, it is uh, cost, as I said, um, almost three times cheaper than uh, standard BSS. Next slide. With this smart methodology, it gives many other possibilities. First of all, it um, allows more frequent tracking of um, risk behavior, access and utilization of services, which is very important when we are talking about uh, adjustment of the program to the uh, changing needs of the community. Um, methodology was able to produce data that we already used for the program. Uh, participants felt very comfortable when study was implemented by uh, service providers, and uh, it also gave possibility to test individuals involved in the study on other infections, and it helped us to reach individuals who were not reached uh, by our current programs. Next slide, please. Uh, as the study was implemented at the service uh, providers, uh, we were able to provide full range of services to all participants. We identified and linked to treatment 214 uh, people who inject drugs with active HCV infection and 80 cases of chronic uh, hepatitis C also uh, were linked to care. Next slide, please. Uh, data generated through the study we used for changing uh, the risk reduction counseling. Uh, we uh, are going to use uh, for advocacy fact that many of our users use naloxone distributed through the program for over uh, death, uh, death prevention. Uh, and also uh, we learned that many of our uh, Users are uh, using both uh, ambulance finish program and substitution treatment. We are thinking how to integrate these services. Next slide, please. And uh, I would like to emphasize the trust and data ownership. When studies implemented by community-based organizations itself, they have greater trust in the results. Also, study participants, we believe they are more open uh, answering very sensitive questions than uh, when studies implemented by outsiders. And also uh, community-based organizations are learning how to use research data and they are they started thinking about future potential research questions. Next slide, please. Oh, it was my last slide. Thank you very much. And I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kedivan, for this great presentation. Um, and really, um, a light approach and, and budget-wise also quite feasible um, for probably other countries as well to apply for monitoring um, outcomes of depopulation programs. Um, so with that, I think we can move now to the next session, which is really critical because um, what 
this webinar tries to do, and I think what also effective country monitoring um, and programmatic review processes do, is they bring together government, community, and partners to look at the data together. Um, and that's why it's so important that we also have the community-led monitoring perspective um, on, on, on prevention. And we start here with the uh, presentation from Amiri Akban from Nigeria, looking at community-led monitoring of the needle and syringe program for people who inject drugs. All right, thank you very much, Clemens, for the opportunity. I hope you can hear me clearly. I can hear you loud and clear and see you. Okay, so uh, community-led monitoring is a new innovation. It's a way of allowing communities a voice in uh, the way they monitor programs that are meant for them. Next slide. Okay, so basically this is the content, I have the background, the purpose of uh, the community-led monitoring, steps to developing the framework, implementation levels, advocacy using the data collected from the community-led monitoring, the challenges and how we can improve it. Next slide. Okay, so basically yeah, the community-led monitoring was funded by the Global Fund through the Community Rights and Gender Strategic Initiative that was uh, extended to Drug Harm Reduction Advocacy Network. Drug Harm Reduction Advocacy Network is the drug user network in Nigeria. And the purpose of it was to use, to, for it to be used to monitor the needle and syringe program in the three pilot states of Oyo, Abia, and Gombe states where they were implemented. Uh, it, the monitoring was targeted at both uh, the community level where the actual needle and syringe program is implemented and the facility level where we have the linkages and referrals for other services, including therapy. The indicators were developed by community members. So it was wholly led by uh, people who use drugs Next, next slide, please. Okay. So, what was the purpose of the community-led monitoring? Uh, first, because uh, the needle and syringe program is a new program that has just been introduced as part of the service package for people who use and inject drugs in Nigeria. It was uh, to monitor the quality of the needle and syringe program service provision to monitor access of community members, that is people who inject drugs to the services, to monitor the acceptability of the NSP needle and syringe program service, to monitor compliance with the NSP implementation standard, and to monitor stockouts of commodities, and also to serve as a way of understanding the community needs as it pertains to the needle and syringe program. Next slide. So how did we go about developing the community-led monitoring framework? So first of all, we had a meeting with the drug user community leaders. The leaders in this case are, are organization leaders, people who lead drug user organizations in Nigeria to define the indicators, look at what they would really love to monitor in the program. And then uh, there was a process of contracting of a consultant to develop the uh, framework and refine the indicators that we already uh, contributed by the uh, community leaders. And then there was the review of the framework and indicators that was refined by the consultants, by community leaders. And then uh, it went back to the consultants who coded it and put it on an online data collection platform. In this case, what was used is a uh, Kubo Collins. And then uh, training of uh, the data collectors by the consultants on how to use uh, the data collection platform and also on how to uh, um, how to uh, also collect data and interpret it and then uh, the piloting of the uh, community led monitoring tools, the review of the tools after the piloting to see what uh, community members felt 
uh, could be changed, what could be reviewed at both the community and facility level, and then the rollout of the implementation of the community-led monitoring. Next page. So what are the implementation levels at which uh, the community-led monitoring was implemented? There was uh, the facility level and the community level. For the facility level, the data that was collected was uh, mainly quantitative data, which uh, was done through the use of a, a questionnaire, an interview model. And at the community level, data collected was both quantitative and qualitative. Uh, for the quantitative data, it was through interpersonal interviews, and for the qualitative data, it was through focal group discussions. The target was to uh, reach uh, 50 persons through focal group discussions, and each of the focal group discussions was made up of uh, 10 persons. Next. So after collection of the data, the good thing with the, the online uh, collecting a platform, a data collecting platform was that uh, it had, uh, you could do preliminary um, analysis of the data and before going into doing a manual complex uh, analysis of the data. So after we got the results, including inputs from community members. The next step was how to ensure that uh, what we found out in the field was actually used to influence how the program was implemented and improve the quality of the program implementation. And the platform that was used for this was mainly at the state uh, technical working groups because we had uh, periodic meetings of uh, technical working groups and there we made presentations on what we we saw on the field what we heard from community members and what we uh, understood from visit to the facilities. We also uh, used coordination meetings like that presented in the picture, which is uh, organized uh, by the drug user uh, led organization in one of the states, from the states. So that afforded us an opportunity to talk about issues that uh, came out clearly when we went for data collection. Some of those issues were issues like uh, law enforcement arrest because of the criminalized environment. And so since at these coordination meetings, we have law enforcement, it was an opportunity to talk to them about what we were doing and how the arrest of uh, people who inject drugs affects the rollout of the Nicholas Ridge program. There's also the global fund implementation structure, which is a, a principal recipient and sub recipients. Directly, the sub recipients oversees the programs in the state, while the principal recipients oversees the program in, in the country. And so, whatever we found out, there was always this opportunity to write to the sub recipient to inform them about what the issues we found out are. And uh, in some cases, we quickly resolved like uh, issues of stock out of needles and syringes, issues of um, um, non acceptability of the, the type of needles and syringes that are sent to the community by the uh, uh, principal recipient. We quickly resolved through this uh, mechanism. And then uh, visitation to relevant institutions. Where we, the cases that we had about the one-stop shops when the community members felt that they were not getting the kind of services they felt they should get at the one-stop shop facilities, which is funded by the Global Fund, uh, we actually pay visits to them. So the uh, community-led monitoring saved, saved as a, a quick and effective way of getting for information on what is going wrong at the uh, community level that is not allowing the uh, Netherlands Fringe program to, to be uptaken by community members and not allowing the community members to uh, also have access to the services that are provided. Next. So what were the challenges that we had in implementing this? First of all, it was uh, resistance by uh, facilities to CLM 
um, it felt like we were actually coming to uh, um, monitor what they were doing or we were supervising them. So there was little resistance from there until they, they came to understand the reason why we were doing what we were doing. And even at that, for public facilities where people who inject drugs go to assess services, there was still uh, not that much cooperation, um, like um, in the specialist hospital where we usually take um, serious wound um, abscesses and uh, wound issues, injecting wound issues too. There was no, it was not easy um, having the staff to uh, respond to the questions that were posed to them. Limited understanding of indicators for development of questionnaire was also an issue. And that was uh, from community leaders of people who use drugs and uh, also limited knowledge of data analysis among the community-led organizations. We will agree that the community-led monitoring is a new innovation and most people are yet to be conversant with how data analysis is to be done. And since this uh, program was domiciled in the organizations, um, the capacity was not readily available. So there was also issue challenges of limited funding for community-led data collection uh, because these data are collected by uh, people who use and inject drugs. They needed some form of uh, transportation stipend, which we provided, but which they felt was not sufficient for the activity. As co perceived conflicts of interest from community-led organizations leading community-led monitoring because it felt like um, you are the one implementing the program and you are the one monitoring yourself. So uh, that is one of the challenges we had. Disagreements of stakeholders on reports of uh, the uh, CLM. Most uh, stakeholders, when uh, the gaps in the uh, service implementation and the issues arising from uh, the implementation of the NSP is presented to them, they uh, seem to disagree and argue about uh, um, what was reported. Next. Okay, so how do we improve uh, community-led monitoring for key population communities and in particular people who use and inject drugs? One of the ways is to uh, improve the capacity of key populations on uh, community-led monitoring and that will include not just key population beneficiaries of service but also key population uh, leaders and key population organization staff. There should be an institution of uh, community-led monitoring as an integral part of program implementation for key population because it allows um, us to hear the voices of key populations who are the service beneficiaries in real time. The issues they have with the service we are giving, the issues they have with the way we are giving the service and what they think we should do. After all, like we say, they are the experts in the issues concerning them. Uh, there's a need to establish advocacy platforms for real-time resolution of issues raised and notice during CLM. Most of the uh, platforms that we used were naturally uh, created for different purposes. And uh, if we were not opportune to be in that space, then there would have been no way we would have been able to raise the issues that we noticed from the CLM. Also improve funding for data collection for CLM. Like I said earlier, community members who were involved in data collection felt that uh, the transport support we were giving them was uh, grossly inadequate for the, the places they had to visit to collect data. And then advocacy with facilities for acceptance of the CLM. Uh, is one of the things we will need to do. There will need to be a widespread uh, sensitization to uh, health, both public and uh, uh, program uh, facilities on why we need the CLM. Thank you very much. I think that's the last. Next. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you, Aniedi, for sharing this community perspective. We had on the agenda a second intervention here from Sean Rick. Um, now, I'm not sure whether we have the speaker. I, I'm informed he may, uh, and they may not have 
and made it. I'm just giving a moment in case there's any body to represent trans community speaker. Okay, so if not, then I, I think we can move to the next next agenda item, which is again a reflection on Menti. Um, so um, Karabo has posted again the Menti link in the chat. So please click on that link. Um, and the first question is, what is the most important action you will take to strengthen monitoring and the evaluation of key population programs? in your country um, and think about this calendar calendar year. Um, and of course, those can be actions that you have prioritized as part of your national dialogues. Could also be something that you know you were inspired to by what the speakers presented. Um, and as the answers come in, we will start showing them showing them again. At the risk of biasing you, or, or maybe that's not, not even a risk, but um, I, I just like to say, I mean, we're in a critical year also for prevention financing, and um, that of course includes financing of key population responses. Um, there's important global fund processes ongoing, and a lot of the data that we saw and the you know information we saw is also relevant for for these global fund processes and one one critical element there is the data all the data that Keith presented is really important for the um, prioritization of key population responses um, especially information on HIV incidence the high HIV incidence rates of key population will just illustrate that any prevention investment for key population will provide greater value for money. Um, the same applies for to, to some of the subsequent um, um, presentations, whether it, it was um, um, you know, Kenya National Program Monitoring Approach, elements of that, the BBS slide, and the community-led monitoring could all be featuring also in, in, those, in those funding requests. Um, it seems like, I'm not sure we're getting responses. Um, Carabo, so I don't know whether there's a technical reason we are having here. Um, yes, Clemens, there's a technical reason. That's what Carabo tells me. So I think we can move on. Okay, we can move on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Well, in any case, I think it's an important um, um, issue to reflect upon what, what the critical issues what the critical issues will will be in in monitoring um, key population programs for your for your country in the next in the next twelve months. Um, if we, we we look back, we have really spanned the whole spectrum of 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 monitoring in this in this webinar. Started with with the broader epidemiology and the, the data in terms of population size estimates and new HIV infections, transmission, um, HIV transmission patterns, sources of new infections. Um, and this information, of course, is available from different types of models. Keith showed what UNH is doing, but we have a number of other, other models that, that are being used in countries. And I'd just like to um, repeat here and encourage you to use this information on HIV incidence, HIV incidence rate, um, in, in, in the context of ongoing funding decision making, because it will be um, critical to use and ensure that we have actually programs focused on, on the populations um, that are most affected. And we know um, globally these are key populations, obviously, with different um, um, country specific breakdowns. But even in countries where the majority of numbers of new infections are not among key populations. These data on incidence rate shows that by reaching relatively small populations in those contexts, in, 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 in including in Africa, um, can still have a relatively high 
high impact. And of course, there's also other prevention needed for other populations. But that high impact of key population prevention is really global as these incidence data, data suggests. The second thing is, um, and we see that in our prevention scorecards really through the regular reporting and the analysis we do, we have still scope to improve a lot on prevention coverage and outcome monitoring. And we saw the Kenya example with all the interim instruments, both in terms of routine um, routine data and, and specific outcome uh, monitoring approaches. And we saw it again in the in the presentation from, uh, from Georgia, that it's really possible to do this kind of outcome monitoring. Um, as we're just completing this year's global AIDS monitoring, let me just encourage you also um, to follow these approaches and um, aggregate data from different um, partners in the, in, in the response as the Kenyan national system does. So HEPA implementers, Global Fund implementers, bring that data on um, coverage of of prevention programs together with your national size estimates for key populations and try to establish um, what the proportion of key populations reached with prevention services actually is in the in the country. We see great gaps in the reporting and the global AIDS monitoring every year on this. And if you can still do that in, in the data validation process for this year, that would be that would be great because also disinformation is critical for program gap analysis and informing funding requests and informing where to go next with 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 with, with the programs so great examples here for coverage and outcome monitoring and and opportunities to use that in in our uh, an analytics um and finally i think we saw here a good example from nigeria on on community led monitoring and there's so many more um and bringing these perspectives together, it's this dialogue where we can really build on insights from data, from science, from program monitoring, but at the same time, bring in that community perspective and have this dialogue and seeing where we are with, with programs, prevention or treatment, and how we can, can improve. And annual um, review meetings on this at the national level, um, perhaps using instruments like scorecards, using instruments like size estimates, program monitoring data are really critical in 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 um, um, making key population data not um, something that sits on shelves, but really something that actively is used in improving improving programs. So with that, um, I'd just like to thank um, all the speakers for the great presentations, also keeping to time, we are finishing on time, and big thanks also, as always, to the great and wonderful team at the uh, South to South Learning Network, um, uh, and I, I not, not name them all, um, um, but Perinita, Carabo, um, Mika, and all other colleagues who have helped um, making this um, webinar happen. And the recording will always be, will also be available on the um, South to South Learning Network YouTube channel. So thank you so much for every, to everyone again, and, and have a great day or evening. Thank you.